Welcome, green thumbed enthusiasts, to another episode of Sun Grown Stories, where we explore the fascinating world of holistic horticulture. Today, we have an exciting announcement for all our listeners. Are you ready to unlock the secrets to cultivating the garden of your dreams? Look no further than Queen of the Sun Grown's Holistic Horticulture Class Series. Dive deep into sustainable cultivation methods and nurture your plants with care and expertise. Our classes are carefully crafted to empower both seasoned gardeners and beginners alike. With over three hours of recorded instruction in each class, you'll gain valuable insights, tips, and techniques to cultivate vibrant, thriving gardens. But wait, there's more. For a limited time, use the code BLAZE to unlock an exclusive 30% discount when you buy any three classes together. And as a special bonus, you'll gain access to exclusive materials, including recipes for nutrient-rich teas and fertilizers, articles and eBooks, such as the 40-page Living Soil E textbook and the Cannabis Pest Guide, complete with IPM protocols. Don't miss out on this opportunity to prepare for your best outdoor season yet. Whether you're growing cannabis, vegetables, or flowers, our Holistic Horticulture class series has something for everyone. Visit our website at queenofthesungrown.com and let's embark on this journey to greener pastures together. Happy gardening! Stay tuned for more inspiring stories and valuable insights on Sun Grown Stories. Until next time, happy gardening! to episode three of Sun Grown Stories, Germination and Growth. I'm Alexandria Irons, your guide through the verdant world of holistic gardens. As a garden writer, educator, and enthusiast for all things green, as well as a mother, wife, and fellow journeyer on this planet, I invite you to dive into the beginnings of plant life with me. In this episode, We're unraveling the mysteries of life itself. Well, maybe a little bit of plant life. Every journey, including ours, starts from a humble beginning. Think about it. You, me, our dogs and cats, all of us begin from a moment of fusion where a single sperm cell met an egg to form a zygote. Plants share this miraculous start with their lives beginning within the protective embrace of a seed, awaiting the spark of fertilization by pollen. Building on what we uncovered in our last episode about achieving feminized seeds, those wonder seeds promising 98% female genetics through the marvel of female pollen created from silver thiosulfate treatments, we dive deeper. Whether our seeds are feminized or of the regular variety, their journey of life kicks off in much the same way. Dating back to the late Devonian period, some 360 million years ago, plants that begin life as a seed, known as spermotophytes, heralded a revolution in the plant kingdom. This evolutionary leap enabled plants to spread across new terrains, reshaping Earth's ecosystems. Seed plants mastered the art of reproduction without the direct need for water, breaking free from the constraints that held back their spore-reliant ancestors like ferns and mosses. The advent of seeds was nothing short of a milestone in Earth's ecological saga, paving the way for the rich tapestry of life that carpets our world today. But let's not forget, these seeds didn't evolve in isolation. They were surrounded, influenced, and shaped by a myriad of other life forms, particularly microorganisms. Indeed, the microscopic world of fungi and bacteria has been instrumental in sculpting the evolution of plants enriching our planet's diversity and ecological resilience through cooperation as well as conflict. 
In today's exploration, we turn our attention to the soil food web, the very foundation of plant health. We'll discuss which microorganisms are beneficial in the early stages of plant development and uncover the best practices for germinating cannabis seeds to ensure they grow up strong and healthy. Joining us are expert guests, plant geneticist Dr. Gary Yates and renowned garden author Jeff Lowenfels, along with commercial cultivator Kimmy Mullen, who will all share their insights on nurturing plant life from seed to bloom. So whether you're a seasoned gardener or just starting to let your green thumb show, this episode promises a wealth of knowledge and inspiration. Let's embark on this journey together through the life of plants from the ground up. Before you begin germinating your seeds, you should consider the significance of the soil food web and how it will impact your plant's life. One of the best ways to learn about these relationships is through a series of books called Teeming With by Jeff Lowenfels. My name is uh, Jeff Lowenfels and I am now the author of a quadrilogy, not a trilogy, but a quadrilogy of books that are basically on soil and soil microbes. And uh, if you're an organic person then you or a regenerative person, then these are definitely books that you need to have in your library. Yes, definitely. I've got them. Um, your books were an integral part of my learning um, process for the soil food web. Um, I went to school for natural science, but hmm. really started focusing on sustainable agriculture. And uh, your books were just a great foundation and helped Good. me understand, you know, complex topics in a very relatable, easy to digest way. So definitely Good. recommend I'm them. Good, 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 good. Yeah, yeah. I wrote the teaming series, uh, you know, for for my mother, uh, so that she could understand it, and that, that and I and I wrote it for myself, so I had to dumb it down so that I could understand it. And so I, I think they are readable, and uh, they really do tell a story that's been changing. Uh, and so if you if you've just read the first book, Teaming with Microbes, uh, I would highly recommend you read the last book, Teeming with Bacteria, next, and then Teeming with Fungi, and then Teeming with Nutrients. Um, the latest book uh, describes uh, a new loop, which we didn't know existed when the first book was written. Of course, similarly, we really didn't know much about mycorrhizal fungi when the first book was listed, but this this particular this particular new a uh, phase of the soil food web called the rhizophagy cycle is key, very, very important. That people need to need to read it, and I and I I know people are, but not in not in the numbers they should be. Because when I go and look at Google, it's it's the fourth, it's the fourth best selling of the list of of my books, and it really should be right up there uh, with with the top ones because it's a very important new concept. Right. Okay, everybody listening, that's your homework. Get it and read it and then yeah, give it a review. With, teaming with bacteria. <laughs> that's right. Teaming with bacteria. Get it. Read it. Uh, teaming, teaming with microbes concentrates on what's known as the poop loop. Uh, you know, uh, the exudates attract bacteria and fungi. They get eaten by the bigger guys, the microarthropods, etc. And eventually, you end up with the bacteria and the fungi being pooped out, the excess from the nematodes and the protozoa, uh, and it, it, it feeds the plant. The mycorrhizal fungi form a relationship with the plants and transfer the food from the fungi into the plant in return for the uh, exudates. And then this new one, rhizophagy, the bacteria actually go into the roots and produce nitrogen inside the roots and can provide up to 40% of the plant's nitrogen. Uh, and we never even knew about it until 2017. So uh, it's really... Fun stuff. This rhizophagy cycle, whilst only discovered in 2017 by us mere humans, has been in full effect and known by plants for millions of years. 
This cycle is a symbiotic relationship between plants and endophytic bacteria, where sugars produced by plants through photosynthesis are consumed by bacteria that enter the root tips of plants, where they're stripped of their nutrients and replenished with sugars. Then they're sent back out into the soil to find more nutrients and bring them back to the plant. This type of relationship isn't confined to just bacteria though. As Jeff mentioned, mycorrhizal fungi also do this. In fact, 90% of all plants have a relationship with mycorrhizal fungi and cannabis is no different. Specifically, Glomus intradices and Glomus mosaea, two different strains of fungus, endomycorrhizal fungus, are known to have a symbiotic relationship with cannabis. Ensuring that these fungal spores are inoculated on your cannabis root tips as early as possible is going to optimize their immune system, is going to increase the availability of nutrients, especially phosphorus, which can tend to be hard to pull out of soil particles. Yet mycorrhizal fungi does an excellent job. It also increases besides nutrient uptake, water flow, as well as communication via the mycelial web, which are made up of fungal hyphae that grow out from the fungal spore. So get this, we inoculate our cannabis plant with Glomus intradices or Glomus mosaea. That relationship begins and the fungal hyphae start growing out spreading further and further. They feed on carbohydrates, things like lignin, help decompose, and as they're growing and feeding, their acids are solubilizing or making minerals available. These minerals can then be transported along with water and other information to the plants that are connected and growing within that mycelial web. If you have a single garden bed that's inoculated by this type of fungus, a plant on one side of the bed could be tapped into the same mycelial network as a plant on the other side of the bed. If pests attack one of those plants, they can translate this information through the mycelial web so that the other plants can be prepared and start producing secondary metabolites that will prevent or warn off pests. It's actually quite amazing the things that fungus can do. And that's why it's so important to consider the entire ecosystem that your plants share, especially when you're growing outside. There's all kinds of life forms at play in the natural world. Making these careful observations and understanding a little bit about how the natural world works is going to give you a huge advantage as a gardener. These interactions are all part of the soil food web and will be explored deeply in episode five. But in the meantime, I'll give you a high level overview. Everything in the world, including soil, relies on microorganisms for one thing or another from beer and wine to cheese and yogurt. The process of chemical changes occurs due to catalysts. These catalysts oftentimes come in the form of enzymes and acids. They're, and they are produced by these tiny little creatures, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes. In fact, the human body contains more microbial DNA than human and our body systems rely heavily on having a healthy microbiome. From serotonin imbalances in our gut, to yeast overgrowth in our private parts, to skin conditions and bacterial infections, our body is constantly being influenced by microbes, and plants are no different. Having a healthy microbiome is every organism's first line of defense against viruses and other pathogens. 
As humans, we're inoculated at birth when we pass through the vaginal canal, and furthermore, as we suckle from our mother's bosoms. These microbes protect us from unwanted guests that can wreak havoc on our bodies. And we have our mothers to thank for the start of our natural immunity. So once again, here's a reminder to thank your mom for everything she's done for you, intentionally and microbially. Plants are no different. In this case, mother plants pass specific types of microbes to their seeds through a process known as vertical transmission. This fascinating natural mechanism ensures that the next generation of plants inherits a beneficial microbiome, ready to support their growth and health from the moment they begin to develop. These types of microbes transmitted can include a variety of bacteria and fungi, each playing critical roles in the seedling's life. These microbes can enhance nutrient uptake, improve disease resistance, and stimulate growth essentially equipping the seed with a microscopic toolkit for survival and success in its environment. Unfortunately, many commercial growers have to use inert or lifeless growing mediums with synthetic nutrients that do not rely on microbial digestion of nutrients and have kept the sterile mindset from germination to harvest. Many home growers pick up on commercial techniques that aren't necessary for their unique scenario. One example is soaking seeds in hydrogen peroxide. While hydrogen peroxide can kill microbes on the seed shell, it does not discriminate between harmful pathogens and beneficial microbes. Therefore, its use can also remove potentially beneficial microorganisms that could contribute to the seedling's health and resilience. Gardeners and growers must balance the benefits of reducing disease risks with the potential loss of beneficial microbial associations when they decide to use things like hydrogen peroxide for seed treatment. In a commercial setting where much of the process is sterilized due to the high propensity of viruses and pathogens, this makes sense. I decided to ask Dr. Gary Yates, geneticist and plant pathogen specialist, what he thought the best way to start seeds was. That's a good question to ask. I think, like, so, okay, so, so my opinion's a little bit split on this because if I'm working for a commercial licensed company to do medical cannabis growing in Europe, then we're entirely using an inert growing system, essentially, right? So everything's like rock well and salty water. Nothing is allowed to be done in soil, for example, right? So it goes against all my natural tendencies, um, but I've had to learn how to do that. In that situation where timing is on, the timing of a commercial grow has obviously got bigger ramifications if you mess anything up, right? So getting everything synchronized, soaking seeds is a good way to help synchronize germination. Using hydrogen peroxide there is a way to prevent any potential early infections that would, again, cause the count to be reduced. And you're going to go into an inert grown environment, essentially. It's not, I mean, it can never be truly inert, but you know what I mean? It's like, it's basically devoid of all the things that it would find in, in the earth. So... In that sense, actually soaking seeds, I think, is a good idea because with I, I, I would the one the one pushback I would say is that hydrogen peroxide is definitely not the best chemical to use though um, for for various reasons because it's quite harmful in, in many respects for other reasons. Um, there is other things out there which maybe we'll go into separately, but. But finding the right thing, I think you'll get away with just water soaking in that situation. It's it's fine, uh, especially if the water doesn't contain too much minerals or salt from, you know, tap water is not a good idea, for example. Um, I always try and use rainwater or rainwater, reverse osmosis or filtered, uh, you know, that's basically my preference order. Um, filtered actually works quite well if you let it, you know, dechlorinate naturally for 24 hours or something like that. Um, but so so that's so that's my commercial answer. You want me to go into a, a facility and pop 1,200 seeds to you know put into production immediately because they're grown from seed because that's the way the license is set up. Then sure, yeah, I'll do a, 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 a 16 hour hydrogen peroxide soak at 0.5 percent because it's probably in the SOPs, right? So you you see what I mean? I didn't write that SOP though, um, because again I would use a, a more natural um, a more uh, a more natural substance like chlorine. What would you use? I'd use chloris, 
Chlorus is a is a, is a, is a substance that your body makes um, to fight micro uh, uh, infectious agents when your macrophages you know latch onto a microbe they inject it with chlorus and chlorus is like is like from the chloride family but chloride is like very very um basic in ph so it's got high ph chlorus is ph neutral and you get commercially available chlorus but it's chloride that's been pH down and obviously there's a bunch of acid in there right but if you can find someone who naturally synthesizes chlorus you can spray it on your face and your eyeball and your mouth on your clothes does nothing but it keeps up it keeps all the bad pathogens at bay so you know that that's what I would use because it also it, it doesn't I don't believe adding anything enhances germination but what it what that can do is, is stop any potential infectious infectious agent from you know making the seed abort which is something that's obviously not talked about much in cannabis as well what they call in the other um, crop industry they call them abnormals so seeds that partly develop and then they just do something weird and often don't go beyond that point and usually in a seed lot outside cannabis you get anything between five and to zero but five usually around about five percent abnormals in, in in the seed batch so but that's often because of some kind of residual microbe that makes the plant basically just go into shock really early and stop and, and abort development. Um, so yeah, I would, I would use chlorus, but but that's my commercial answer. If you're asking me how I would you know grow seeds on a balcony in Spain, for example, then those seeds would go into compost uh, soil, you know, and they would go in the window ledge um, with some damp newspaper on top of them and they would be left there until they germinated. Some of them will come out in 24 hours, some of them might take 10 days, but that I've had like consistently like 98% germination success doing it that way. Whereas in the commercial level, you know, I don't get anywhere near that rate, you know, often. Well, I get in the 90s, you know, but it's like I, I do lose. And then again, if the seed's older, then pre-soaking it actually does maybe help, you know, coax a couple of them out of their, their dormancy a little bit. Um, but general, my approach would be use a good soil, you know, they can, I can, they, and I don't know, we don't have the same brands, okay, so they, it's, it's hard for me to say what you would use, but we, I like um, jo, John Innes number two pot in soil, very good soil for, for starting any plants off, um, and I just use that same technique that I would use in pretty much any other seed that I grow, you know, like, which is which ranges massively, but that approach for me is just the best, you know, and again, if you keep, my, my idea is that I want that seed to be interacting with a natural biome as soon as possible. That That's my goal there, you know, and um, and, and you let that little synergetic um, exchange work itself out and, and then everything will be okay. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of like a, I don't know, it's a, you, you know, throw the grenade in there, you know, just hope for the best, the kind of thing, but it, it's consistently the best way that I've found to, to, to get um, high levels of germination from, from a seed lot um, but I would honestly say there's there's no special trick to any of this stuff you know there's no like, magic way that we've figured out that's scientifically better in every other way so take the seed stick it in some dirt you know and, and look after it for a bit keep the environment as, as, as good as possible so what environment is as good as possible for a cannabis seed if you look up how to germinate cannabis seeds on the internet, you'll see various methods ranging from 24 hour water soaks to wrapping in wet paper towels to plain old planting in soil. The key here is moisture. Cannabis seeds have a hard, thick shell that requires a lot of moisture to soften the seed coat, which then activates enzymes that initiate the growth process. By soaking your seeds, you can significantly speed up germination by allowing water to penetrate the seed more easily. This method is referred to as seed soaking and is used on a wide variety of cultivated species from legumes like beans and peas to hard seeded flowers like nasturtiums and morning glories. Different species have different germination requirements. For example, the lodgepole pine tree with, contains their seeds within pine cones that will not be released until they've reached 175 degrees Fahrenheit. This means they evolved with forest fires. I think that's something important to remember that all of the cycles on the earth have evolved with nature, within ecosystems, and some species rely on them 
even if it's bad for humans. So taking this into consideration, we can plan more thoughtfully where we build our homes, how we manage forests, and how we manage fire. Luckily, science is ever improving and we're learning more and we're seeing better ways to manage our forests so that our fuel load is lower and fires are incorporated back into the natural ecosystem. On the other hand, other seeds require cold stratification, which is a process used to simulate natural winter conditions that certain seeds must experience before they will germinate. Many plant species, especially those from temperate climates, have developed seeds that require a period of cold exposure to break dormancy. This mechanism ensures that seeds don't germinate until conditions are optimal for survival. Typically in spring when temperatures rise and moisture is more abundant. Some seeds require light while others need darkness. Every plant is unique, but they have one thing in common and that is the need for water. Soaking your hard-coated cannabis seeds for 24 hours in distilled rain, well, or dechlorinated water is the fastest way to break down that outer shell. But soaking your seeds is not necessary, especially if you use a seed germinating potting mix that contains a lot of vermiculite. Vermiculite is a naturally occurring mineral that expands when heated. This is a process known as exfoliation. The expansion results in a lightweight, absorbent, and fire-resistant material that is used in various applications, including soil amendment in gardening and horticulture. It is an aeration material similar to perlite, but with a significantly larger water holding ability that makes a great seed starting mix when combined with equal parts cocoa coir or peat moss. Keep in mind, this combination doesn't contain any fertilizer. Now, seedlings are amazing, obviously, uh, but they're equipped with this remarkable self-sustaining feature, the cotyledons, also known as seed leaves. These are part of the seed's embryo and the cotyledons contain stored nutrients that the seedling uses during its initial growth phase before it's fully capable of photosynthesis and absorbing nutrients from the soil through its roots. The duration that these stored nutrients can support the seedling varies depending on the plant species, but typically seedlings can sustain themselves on their cotyledons reserves for about seven to 10 days after germination. During this period, the seedling focuses on root development and the emergence of its first true leaves. Once the true leaves appear and begin to photosynthesize, the plant can produce its own food, and the reliance on cotyledon stored nutrients diminishes. It's important to ensure that the environment, soil, light, water, is suitable for the seedlings by the time the cotyledon's nutrients are depleted. This ensures a smooth transition from using stored energy to self-sufficiency, setting the stage for healthy growth and development. You can do this by planting your seedlings into a potting mix that contains a light blend of balanced nutrients. You can easily buy this at the store, or you can simply add compost to your peat moss, cocoa, aeration blend. Now, compost varies in nutrient composition, but it contains a wide variety of microorganisms that provide your plants with a robust microbiome. Hopefully, by the time this podcast season is over, each of you listeners will be well-versed in the soil food web and preferably making your own compost. Despite the scientific findings being relatively new in the history of academia, the soil food web and the microorganisms within it are at the heart of all life and should be discussed with more frequency and in a positive frame of light.
Yeah, it's so funny because no one else in my life and all of the different groups of friends and communities that I'm a part of, like nobody else can talk about bacteria, fungi, nematodes, protozoa, like a cannabis grower. Like everyone else is like, what in the hell are you talking about? And we're like, yeah. no, man, the protozoa, it, they eat the bacteria. It helps. But it all, that's right. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it all, it trickles down. That's what I discovered. I mean, you, you could stop where George stopped, you know, and these books are for cannabis cannabis growers and the encyclopedias, et cetera. Uh, or you can carry it a little bit further and, you know, make it much more generic and show people, you know, this, that these things are important, that we studied dinosaurs as little kids. Huh? What for? You know, instead of studying things that were important, like microbes and microarthropods, and, you know, paramecium and bacteria and fungi, which I think people are beginning, are beginning to do. So, uh, in, in, in I write a garden column in Alaska, and I would venture to guess that all of my readers understand the importance of the soil food web, the importance of adding to the soil food web, making it as diverse as possible, and and uh, recognize that the soil food web alterations as they continue to add on new things into the soil food web uh, – make them better gardeners, whether they're growing cannabis, whether they're growing carrots or potatoes. I mean, who would have thought that a potato is coated with mycorrhizal fungi? Huh? You don't think about yeah. that. Or that your roots of your, uh, uh, the, the root hairs in your cannabis roots are formed as a result of bacteria creating them and pushing out and being pushed out of them so that they can regenerate in fresh soil and go back in again. And it's unbelievable the stuff that's going on. So you need to know this stuff in order to be good, good gardeners. It's not enough. I remember when, when George and I first talked, talks about a lot of this stuff and it was just, we were organic um, and we were organic because we didn't want to be poisoned. That's different than being organic because you don't want to be poisoned, but you, you don't want to disrupt the cycle of the plant. You want to let the plant, and then that became the soil food web. You want to let the soil food web operate so that the plant could get what it needs. And that's a that's quite a change from when, when you know, whew, uh, oh, yeah. 40 years I, ago, I, we weren't thinking that way. I mean, it's crazy to think that the soil food web was supposedly discovered, you know, and we're just putting all of this into it in only the last 40, 50 years. But it's been there. It's been existing. And we should appreciate it for it. Simply, it's an intrinsic value. Um, oh, yeah. My background yeah. as an ecologist is like, that's what I went to school for. I studied with ecologists, biologists. I love watching the interaction of species and seeing how that influences an ecosystem. So when I'm teaching people, um, I went, I think, 20. 22, I traveled the country teaching the living soil masterclass to teach people about the significance of the soil food web and why it's more important, like, like you're saying, than just, um, just to even just growing the plant. It has a significant impact on our body's health, on the health of our environment. 90% um, of plant species have a relationship with uh, mycorrhizal fungi and they mm -hmm. evolved with this. And so it's like, like you're saying, why are we st having our kids study dinosaur bones or learn about this when this is intrinsically valuable to our life and the future of our planet, the health of our planet. Um, I got the book from Dr. Mike Amaranthus. Uh, oh, yeah. He sent me a copy of his, his new, children's his, book. No, yeah. the kids one. Yeah. Oh, and okay. so my, yeah, yeah. It's Mike Mike Oriza, and it's a little Mike Oriza yeah. spore, and I read that to my son, and I'm just so happy that we're starting to see that transition right. and change. Um, yeah, but and we're, we're yeah. certainly seeing a lot more. We're seeing m mushrooms are now the thing. Uh, oh yeah, I don't care what you are, old, young, mushrooms. They're pushing whether it's mushroom gummies, mushroom cooking, mushroom. Yeah, you name it. I mean, and you know that's a good thing. That's that that's explaining to people they begin to understand what what these are, what they do. Uh, you know the mycorrhizal fungi. It's and I re you know I remember when I when I wrote 
teaming with fungi, which is about mycorrhizal fungi, and they form a, a visible mushroom as opposed to the, uh, I mean, at least the, the uh, endo ones do. Um, and, you know, it was not fashionable. It was not, uh, uh, my publisher had a little trouble thinking about how this book was going to sell and, and didn't quite get the fact that, no, 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 no. Remember teaming with microbes? That was, and this is, I think, this is Dr. Elaine's great description. That was the poop loop. This is the fungal loop. And then the bacterial is, you know, the bacterial loop. We have these, these additional loops that get added on. And, and gardeners who understand how the poop loop works understand that they need to also get with it and learn the other loops as well because they all work together. And together – they provide that diversity. I'll give you a great example. I think I, I, think I can do this. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is not what you wanted to talk about. But So one of the things that happens with the bacteria is that the, the plant can trick the bacteria into thinking that there is a, a slime, uh, uh, you know, a, a home of slime for them to live in. They live in bacteria in the root zone. They live in slime. They love the slime. That's where they get diversity and they protect themselves from the protozoa who can't get through the slime. And so the plant can admit a, a hormone that makes the plant and the bacteria think there's a slime there. And they, they back into this slime. And when they're in this new kind of slime, they smell this popcorn smell. And it's really butyric acid. And they, and they go and they break through the cell wall into this little periplasmic space. And then they do their thing in there, the razzy fazzy thing, which people need to read about. I won't bore people with it at all. But so that slime is out there. Okay, now come along another study. And I don't think they were aware, you know, these studies aren't aware of each other. Where, where they discovered uh, uh, methyl jasminate, I think it's called. It's, a, it's one of the plant hormones. And it was just recently discovered that a plant can use it by admitting it in the exudate out into the rhizosphere, out through the rhizosphere, past the rhizosphere zone, into the soil to communicate with bacteria and say, hey, get over here. We need you. Uh, I mean, it's just now these bacteria that sneak into the plant have the capability of making that stuff. Endophytic bacteria can make a lot of these plant hormones. So it's all tied together. And if you've got the diversity in the soil, then you're going to have the ability for the plant to attract the right mycorrhizal, to attract the right endophytic bacteria for rhizophagy, it's, and, to, and to attract the right uh, uh, cytophores or cytophores. It's, you know, the, the plant should be in charge. We should be giving the plant the Ritz Carlton hotel room. Well, you know, the the soil should be just fabulous. And then the plant just, and it doesn't matter whether it's cannabis or anything else, and it doesn't matter what zone you're in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, and then your plant is going to reward you by creating more diversity in its uh, secondary metabolites, terpenes, esters, yeah. like all of that is going to be more diverse, more robust um, with the more diversity we have in those microorganisms. It's the communication yeah. between them and it's beautiful and it's going to be better for uh, we're going to enjoy it more and it's better for our me medicine. Yeah, well, and as, yeah, particularly when you start to read some of the things that that Dr. James White from Rutgers and his and his students are studying right now. So, I, and I'm not sure I've read this properly, but I think I have. It's you know these scientific papers take a little while to sort of sink in, but uh, this is a this is sort of an amazing thing. What they found is that. Trichomes, whether they're on cannabis plants or different kinds of plants have trichomes. Uh, these trichomes have bacteria in them, endophytic bacteria, just like the roots do. And one of the things that happens in the root zone, and again, without getting too complicated, the rhizophagy cycle results in the bacteria fixing nitrogen from the air. Now, in order to do that, they've got to have an area that's oxygen-free. 
or has reduced oxygen. So here they are in the trichome. And what reduces the oxygen? Hold it. Wait a minute. The things we want in our medicine, the terpenes and the cannabinoids. They can act as the agent that enables the bacteria to fix bacteria, to fix nitrogen, which, of course, the plant needs in order to grow and to be nutrient dense, therefore good. So maybe terroir comes from these bacteria, not from the soil, but from the seed, which contains the bacteria that jump out into the soil, grow as the plant grows and goes in and go into the plant, feed the plant and move throughout the plant, not only getting into the new seeds, but also producing these plant phytohormones. It's an amazing system. And if you're just eating the carrot that you grow without understanding this, or smoking or vaping the cannabis that you grow without appreciating this, you're missing out on 90% of the beauty of what you've got in front of you. I think that's sort of where I come from and I'm sticking to I it. agree. I agree with you. I think that it is so important and it's exactly 90%. I mean, yeah. being able to have this relationship with, it's not just a cannabis plant. You have millions of different organisms growing with you with this plant it's the whole ecosystem and just being aware observing and it's it's beautiful it's a magical spiritual yeah. connection yeah. so i yeah. agree with you 100 yeah. <laughs> percent. And, and, and you and you can manipulate it i mean we do we add compost teas and compost extracts and we use compost and we use different kinds of of uh, microbe foods i don't call them fertilizers or you can put as much of that stuff into your compost and get the best compost you, or vermicompost you pot or both that you possibly can and let the plant do all the choosing. So you got, you know, you got it both. Uh, where mm -hmm. we make the mistake is thinking we're in charge. No, we don't want to be in charge because we're not capable of doing what that plant has evolved to do over these millions and millions of years. The plants. That's right. That's right. Plants know the best way to take care of themselves, and the key is to provide them with a suitable environment that includes water, sunlight, and microbially active soil. I want to discuss something here, and that is the difference between potting mix and soil. All right, I know I'm going to get a little pushback, but... I gotta say, potting mix is not soil. Potting mix is what you buy in a bag at the garden center, and it is not, absolutely not soil. If you're an avid cannabis cultivator, you're probably familiar with living soil, which is a marketing term used to promote biologically active potting mix. The difference in potting mix and soil is in the composition. Soil is largely composed of decomposing rocks that contain a wide range of minerals. These minerals are broken down through chemical and physical processes that reduce their particle size until they can be chelated or made available to plants by acids produced by microbes. Let me say here again, compost contains a lot of humus Humus is the stabilized organic matter that has been broken down by microorganisms, and it is the world's, natural world's, best chelating agent. So the more compost you add to your native soil, the more enzymes, the more microbes, the more hummus, the more acid, the more humus, the more acids are going to cycle your nutrients more effectively and efficiently. While potting mix is made from harvested or manufactured materials, such as cocoa coir, peat moss, compost, perlite, and fertilizers. It is commonly used in container gardens and is very lightweight, requiring constant reamending and monetary inputs. So my challenge to you this year is one, Start a compost pile if you don't have one. And two, try planting in the ground to regenerate your native soil and build it up. 
Regardless of what type of soil you have, whether it's predominantly sand, silt, or clay, there is a way to grow your plants in the ground. It may not be this year, but with thoughtful planning and preparation, you can definitely harness your local soil food web and build up a rich and robust soil that will cost less in inputs every single year. Remember Kimmy Mullen from last week's episode? She's the owner of Jackalope Farms. Well, she turned her rock-filled native clay soil into black gold by using Hugo pits and compost in real soil, saving tons of money. Because you're planting directly in the ground. You're not buying potting mix, and there's a huge difference between potting mix and soil. Soil. Real soil. Yeah, exactly. Sand, silt, clay. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that's like such a hot point, like between like the living soil people and like soil people. Um, I love the living soil crew. Heck yeah. Microbes all the way. But I think there is a confusion on like Mm -hmm. potting mix, soilless media versus like soil. Sand silt clay mix. Say it louder um, for the people. In the back. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, usually yeah, I don't talk about this much because it I don't want to like hurt anyone's feelings. <laughs> um, <laughs> about like the definition of soil and like whatever. Who am I to say like your soilless media isn't soil? Because technically, it would compost down into soil eventually oh the organic Um, fraction of soil which is a very very small portion of the soil horizon yeah i'm at like a i'm at like a seven percent organic that's pretty good though it's good like it was three i think when i started so i've gotten it up four percent in the past um couple years which is great like i love my soil um hell yeah so yeah if you're swayed by like Okay, yeah. So you have no idea what you're doing and you're like, okay, yeah, I want to plant in the ground, but everyone uses potting mix. Um, That is not the case. You do not have to do that. There are ways to work with the soil that you have to make it more conducive to cannabis plants and they will love it and they will thrive. Like I always argue like root space is way more important than uh, anything else. Like a Mm -hmm. plant doesn't want to be in a pot. They want to send roots down and if you got healthy roots you got a healthy plant the bigger Um, the roots the bigger the shoots the bigger the fruits baby (laughs) that's right that's right um yeah i'm definitely all about root space um i would take that over anything i would grow in clay well no not clay i definitely tried to grow in some clay and uh, i love clay why does everyone hate clay i don't hate clay i just didn't at like i was like ah let's I was doing experiments to see what I could get away with. So clay without added organic material or like adding some sand. Um, So yeah, say you have a clay soil, go get some bags of sand that will break it up excellently and then add some organic material, even just mulch. I used a ton of mulch to break up because I had, I got all this um, Creek bottom soil, um, locally for my first pits and it was just there's so much nutrients in it but it's locked up in the clay so to be able to get access that nutrition you have to like restructure the soil so by adding sand and um, organic material it's broken down and now I can just like dig through it with a shovel um, after about one season and all that nutrients that was locked up in the clay is now coming out over a long term so if you have clay it's not an end-all like totally workable and i think a lot of people get discouraged and there's not that much information out there to like hey this is what you're working with or like say you have yeah tons of rocks i live on a a rock mountain i bought a rock mountain (laughs) (laughs) everyone thinks i'm like really into hygge culture and like like obsessed with it but it was like the only (laughs) option for me (laughs) You're obsessed so with now, like, and hugo culture. Yeah. <laughs> it's like only by like necessity of like what I have to work with. Um, 
Yeah. Because, like, yeah, I'm definitely known as, like, the hookah culture person. Like, oh, yeah, you use rabbit shit and logs. I'm like, <laughs> yes, but, like, it's kind of all I got. Um, but it does grow excellent cannabis. Like, I've been growing some of the best weed with it. And, like, it's basically zero effort at this point um, on my part for, like, inputs. I don't spend any money on fertilizers. Only a couple just to, like, you Insert know, Kimmy excerpt. Add some nice things. Can you imagine where we think about our soil health and how we can reduce our waste and turn it into microbially active compost that is feeding our plants and in turn feeding or giving back to us? 40% of all landfill waste could be composted at home, reducing toxic leachate, carbon footprint, and limited landfill space. There are plenty of resources on how to compost and a wide variety of methods from vermi composting with worms to thermophilic composting that uses bacterial heat to kill off pathogens and seeds. I have an entire class on how to regenerate your soil and compost called Winter Soil Wellness. You can check it out on my website, queenofthesungrown.com. And as always, listeners get 20% off with code SUNGROWN. I want you guys to start thinking about that tiny seed and how it has the ability to grow into a massive cannabis plant that can easily produce three to five pounds when planted directly in the ground with sufficient light, water, and microbially active and mineral rich soil. Each of us started life like that seed. Some of us are further on our path than others, but each of us has the same chemical composition with our futures yet unwritten. Each choice we make shapes our future and the people we become. Do you want to have a robust immune system surrounded by a diversity of rich experiences, leaving a positive impact on the world you live in? Because that's a choice we all have to make. While the news and propaganda like to scream how much harm humans have done the planet, Think about how many positive things we can do just by growing a plant. A plant that has the ability to heal cancer, feed humans, feed animals, build homes, and regenerate our soil. As we start our seeds for this upcoming season, let's set our intentions for prosperity and growth and understand the profound impact our choices have on the ecosystem we live within. Maybe this year it's simply planting native milkweed outside to provide our monarch butterflies with nesting and feeding opportunities. Which reminds me, milkweed seeds benefit from cold stratification and seed soaking. So sowing them outdoors in the fall gives them the natural cold stratification process that they would experience over winter, but you can simulate that process by putting them in a damp paper towel or seed starting mix inside your refrigerator for 30 days. After that, you can start them in seed starting mix in trays or pots and cover them with plastic and place under artificial lights or simply in a south-facing windowsill. This process will be very similar to starting your cannabis seeds, minus the cold stratification, but soaking them, preparing them for life outside. So depending on where you live and when your last frost date is, you can start moving your plants outside once overnight temperatures Don't drop below 50 degrees. So when you move any plant that has been started inside to the great outdoors, it is important you go through the hardening off process. This process gets young plants used to the varied environment they can experience outside. From wild temperature fluctuations to drastic changes in relative humidity to simply being blown over by the wind. You can harden your plants off in as little as three days by taking them outside during the nicest part of the day. Then when it gets a little rough, bring them inside. After several days of acclimation, they should be ready to transition to life outdoors. It's important to remember that if you are using artificial lights on photo period plants like cannabis, you can mess up their natural light cycle. So for instance, if you start your seeds inside, and give them 18 hours of artificial light for two months before you move them outdoors. Then you start transitioning them 
outside where there's a natural light cycle, which is more close to 14 or 15 hours of daylight, depending on your location to the equator, your plant may think it's time to start flowering from that abrupt transition of 18 hours to a fluctuating 14 or 15 light cycle. So the simplest solution is to just start your seeds in a window seal and rely on natural light to start. Otherwise, you can set your artificial light timer to match up with the natural light cycle. And seedlings naturally grow with this natural light cycle. So they'll remain in a vegetative state outdoors even when the length of night is relatively long in those early spring days. This rhythm is only messed up when artificial lights are introduced. And believe me, I have had many seeds that I've started inside, not thinking about that abrupt transition in the light schedule from indoor to outdoor. And when I moved them outside, they were triggered into flower really early. So let me save you the trouble of having to go through revegging your plants and recommend you start your seeds in a windowsill or better yet, outside in a little greenhouse. If you've already put them under an 18 hour light cycle, don't fret. You can totally slowly, (laughs) lyrical miracle, you can slowly transition them to a 14 hour light cycle by changing the light schedule 15 minutes every few days. So you can do this until the light schedule matches up to their natural circadian rhythm of the sun. So With this information, you are prepared to start your seeds inside with the right amount of light, water, and soil. What are you waiting for? Start popping those seeds. Well, you may be waiting for seeds if you are a part of Blaze. So now is the perfect time for an update on our Citizen Science Grow Along. Blaze, or Botanical Latitude and Zone Evaluation, is a citizen science project initiated by me and my producer, Cat Lady. Our goal is to create an online tool where you can type in your zip code and the best strains for your zone pop out. In order to create these zones, we've employed citizen scientists from around the country to grow the same strain of cannabis graciously donated to our initiative by the Humboldt Seed Company. We are sending out OG Kush strain, in both triploid and diploid form, so we can collect data on how this cultivar performs in different climates and latitudes. We only have room for 100 participants this year and are filling up fast. We will be sending out seeds until June, so if you would like to participate in this first of its kind project, please visit us at patreon.com slash queen of the sungrown. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the Humboldt Seed Company. So let's take a moment to say thank you for our sponsors. I'm so grateful to be a part of this community where we can grow and learn together. I'm looking forward to growing my OG Kush in Hardiness Zone 6B and seeing how it does compared to other participants in Montana, Florida, Virginia, California, Oklahoma, and beyond. In next week's episode, we are going to discuss the lineage of OG Kush and how land race strains have shaped modern genetics. We will explore the differences between sativa, indica, ruderalis, and the little discussed Afghanica. So tune in next week to learn more because the more we know, the more we grow. Once again, thank you to those who have signed up Hands Cold, Flower Farm, Midnight Samurai, Grapenator, Cule Cure, and so many more. Your engagement in this sun-grown community is graciously appreciated. Participants not only get the opportunity to make cannabis history and grow free seeds. Come on, I mean, who doesn't like, love that? But we have a rich community on Discord where I share educational articles, weekly classes, and you can get the full guest interviews featured on this podcast. Benjamin Lynn's interview was shared this month, and we are planning our first roundtable discussion with Jorge Cervantes and Dr. Gary Yates. 
So even if you can't join the Grow Along, there are a ton of other benefits and your support and contributions make all of this possible. So a special thank you to our listeners for simply listening, liking, sharing, and subscribing. This episode was written by me, Alexandria Irons, and produced by Cat Lady and Obtine Yeager, with music by Ayla Nerio. Thank you and happy gardening. There was a flame, there was a flame drawn deep within her chest.